the law is really clear on defining lobbying, which is the actual item that gets measured for all the funders in the room. And it's actually an activity that is designed to influence legislation. So what we want to do initially is encapsulate what's actually measured and what is the limited activity of some of these organizations. So when a C3, whether it's a public charity or a private foundation, is attempting to influence legislation, that's what we want to talk about in the definition of what's being defined. So if you are attempting to contact or urging public to contact with some of your employees, somebody that's a member of a legislative body for the purpose of influencing, either opposing or supporting a piece of legislation, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about lobbying, okay? So we, we want to separate public charities and private foundations because they have different limitations. And I will caveat this with, I noticed on a draft agenda that we had initially that there was a little note at the bottom that at some point the Arizona Grant Rangers will offer a longer presentation on this. It's just a little bit of overview, so just bear with me. We're gonna hit the highlights and not go into a lot of detail. But when you're a public charity, if you have substantial lobbying activities, you can lose your tax exempt status because you turn into what's called an action organization, so you're not really organized and operating exclusively for charitable educational literary purposes. They think you sort of turn into something else at that point, like maybe a C4 organization that can do unlimited amounts of lobbying or pretty close to it. When you're a private foundation, you generally are supposed to refrain from lobbying. Doesn't mean you have to refrain from advocacy, you have to refrain from lobbying. And I just gave you an example of, there is a 20% tax levied on what are called taxable expenditures of private foundation, and that's amounts that are paid for carrying on propaganda, that's how it's in the, in the statute or in the code section, or otherwise attempting to influence legislation. That's a pretty hefty penalty, and there's this really nice yes or no question on the 990 PM. So you get to, you know, that penalty of perjury kind of gets you at the end of that, <laughs> of that statement, so be really careful about that. And public charities that are asking for grants from private foundations need to be really aware of that. I had a private foundation client one time that called me a few years back and said, I have a public charity I made a grant to, and they called, actually they wrote an email, which was even better, and said, we'd like to take you know, $10,000 of the grant you gave us and specifically use it for lobbying. So I'm really trying to wonder how I rewrite the grant. You don't. <laughs> it's a one word, <laughs> no. <laughs> so you know that public charity really did themselves a big disservice by asking the question the way they did because it was a general grant. So why would they send that email back that way? Because you just got yourself a flat no from money that had been given to you for general purposes that could have been used for that request. So public charities that don't understand these laws really do themselves a big disservice when they send that kind of letter right back to the private foundation that now has to specifically say, no, you may not use my money for lobbying. So when we look at public charities, there's a couple of tests real briefly that we want to go over and that measure your lobbying. And you can use one of two tests. There's the substantial part test and the expenditure test. The substantial part test is one that's built right into code section 501c3. And it looks at pertinent facts and circumstances. They consider a variety of factors. And we look at kind of your whole bit of lobbying, volunteer hours, money that you expend. And it's really no substantial part. And you're going to say, I always get the question, well, what does that mean? Give us a percentage. You can't do it. Nobody can. Because the IRS has never laid out a bright line test for that. So they basically say, if you're spending a substantial part of your assets and resources on lobbying, we can not only subject the public charity and the managers who knowingly approve the expenditures to an excise tax, but we'll also revoke your tax exempt status. Really nice result there. And nobody knows how much that is. So if you're going to be doing some lobbying and you know it, and it's going to be substantial, I can't tell you what that is, then you might want to go under the other test, which is called the expenditure test. And lots and lots of organizations are doing this. And this reason this was put into the code was because there has been a big push over the last few years for charities to get into lobbying. People are realizing how important this piece of philanthropy really is. So organizations that know they're going to be lobbying for domestic violence shelter, 
the education, all these things that people are doing now, organizations are going out and doing and moving forward, they needed some bright line tests, hence the 501H election. And you can turn it on and off. So you fill out the form and say we're making the election, and when you do that, you fill out a specific portion of the 990 with these bright line tests. The rules become more clear as to what is lobbying and what isn't lobbying. That's kind of a nice thing as well. And when you're not doing this anymore, you can unelect the election. I'm not sure, you know, there are reasons to do both. This option is not available to churches, governmental entities, or private foundations, and the latter, we all know why, because you're not supposed to be engaging in lobbying anyway, so don't make a mistake and fill out this form. I know some, not a good idea. We're lobbying over here, and we're private foundations. That <laughs> was really not good. So when you're under the election, the 501H election, there are distinctions between direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying, and you'll see there's some similarities. It's any kind of a communication two, and then the classes are different. So one is to legislators or governmental officials and employees, and one is to the general public, and they're both expressing a view about specific legislation, and then the latter one is then making a call to action when you're talking to the general public. Go vote, go call your legislator, go do something. So the grassroots is when you're going out, usually to the general public, okay? And the lobbying, let the amounts are different. So generically, I'm not going to give you all the numbers because the thing that's nice about the 501H election is it's all based on what your exempt expenditures are. So if you spend a half a million dollars in program services, then you have a defined amount that you can spend on lobbying, bright line tests. And then 25% of that can be spent on grassroots lobbying. So again, bright line test. If you spend $17 million in program services, you can spend a million dollars on lobbying. So those are your limits. All right, the good news is there's lots of things that aren't lobbying, and that's what we're, we really want to talk about, right? What can you do that's not lobbying? There's lots of those things. And we're going to hear next about some organizations in town, three, who've done great things that weren't lobbying. Well, some are lobbying. Jody's been <laughs> so one of the big things that organizations do is they get involved in voter education, registration, and get out the vote drives. That's a great thing, not lobbying. We're telling people, go vote. No matter how you vote, just get out and vote. And here's some education on the issues that are out there that you need to be aware of. So let's get out, go vote. If you're only registering people to vote on this one ballot or this one initiative, be problematic. So get out and get people registered to vote. And that's going to be, you have to do it in an unbiased and a nonpartisan way. So if you're only registering Democrats, telling them about this referendum, that's problematic. Nonpartisan analysis study or research. This is a big exception where we have lots of foundations getting involved because they can do a lot under this category and it won't be considered lobbying so then there's no subsequent use, which we'll, get to, which we'll get to at the bottom. So if a particular position or viewpoint is ultimately going to be advocated, that's even okay, as long as there's a sufficiently full and fair exposition of the facts and information. So you want to be sure that it really is a research or, or a paper that has some substance to it. There are some organizations that try to fall under this, but it really is an opinion paper. You know, there's maybe one site somewhere in the whole thing, and that's what Bob said. So Bob's not real authoritative on the subject. But you want to be able to put enough out there that somebody who may not agree with your position can form an opinion from what you're talking about. That's really sort of the litmus test. And then you distribute the results to a wide enough body that it isn't just those that agree with whatever opinion it is that you're putting out there. So linking it on your website, disseminating it to various other groups, that's always a really good way to do it. And you want to be sure that there's not a subsequent use that's out there within six months after you put out the report that it then goes to a specific piece of legislation that's out there that is supported by your position. So when you're going to do this, and you know there's going to be ultimately legislation that comes out of it, be sure you do it well enough ahead of time 
that all of your expenditures for this report are not going to be counted as lobbying expenditures. So you want to be sure that the timing is such that it's not going to get classified as a subsequent use. So that's going to be really important when you're spending quite a bit of money on these. Examinations and discussions of broad social, economic, and similar problems. We, we're going to have an example, example of this later that's going to be really good. So again, provided that you don't address yourselves to a specific piece of legislation, foundations can go out and start these big discussions. This is why we support early childhood education. This is why it's important to our community and our society. We're not talking about that piece of legislation, we're talking about the issue. This is a big issue and this is why we think it's important. And don't directly encourage recipients to take action on that piece of legislation that happens to be coming up. Talk about the issue. So this is a really good way to convene forums and symposia and all kinds of things on, on an issue. Technical advice or assistance. This one can get organizations in trouble because they don't follow the real specific rules here. This is when you're being asked by a body or a committee in writing to provide technical assistance. And you can give your opinion if it's asked for. So when one legislator calls you up and says, could you come down and give us some advice, your response would be, I'd be happy to if the committee could send me a request in writing. Not you, <laughs> but the committee. Because you need to be giving that advice to the body or the committee. So be careful about this one. Did you get really excited? Oh, Senator. Smith wants me to come down and give my opinion. It's not really going to help you if it's not done the right way. So just be careful about falling within this exception and wanting to use it because you may inadvertently find that you've actually done some lobbying work that you thought might fall in this exception. Communicating Communications pertaining to self-defense. And this is another one that's a little difficult to fall into. Lots of people think, well, I'm a domestic violence organization, and so every time I go down there and fight for domestic violence, this is a self-defense, you know, not so much. Because this one only protects you if there is something going on that might affect the existence of the organization, its powers, its official duties, not its cause, or its exempt status. So again, you see how narrow that exception is? So you want to be very careful about trying to use the self-defense one because it's going to be a pretty limited situation where this one may come up. When you are using this one, if something were to come up, we're going to abolish all private foundations in the state of Arizona. You know, have at that one. So, you know, but you're going to have to be really careful about it and you're going to have to specifically limit it to private foundations are a good thing because. Right? So you have to be, again, very careful about this one. Another place where you can actually be pretty effective is in administrative actions, because those aren't going to be considered legislation. So legislation doesn't include things like executive actions. So calling somebody and saying, you know, the executive order that you think you're going to issue or that we keep hearing about or the issue that should come back or judicial processes, work of administrative agencies, school boards, housing authorities, all of those things you can be active in. Attempts to influence actions of regulatory agencies are going to be protected, even if they're promulgating regulations, implementing legislation. So again, you can have a pretty big impact here. So it doesn't include, and I've given you just a couple of examples here. So if you want the legislator to, legislature to start a hearing on an issue, you can go down and you can advocate for that. That's not going to be lobbying. So that's sort of your quick overview of all the tools you have in your toolbox that aren't going to fall under the restrictions. Any questions? How about for both, Eva, why don't you come on up as well? Because I think any questions we have of either one of you. And boy, exceptional job of uh, presenting in a simplistic way something very complicated. And if you don't understand anything, you know you can call Kenneth. So, <laughs> so questions from the audience for either one of our presenters. Are you all sort of overwhelmed by the obstacles? Yeah, please. Okay. So if you need to get it by um, formal request to come to a committee to provide information, but it's not from an individual member 
does it have to come from the chairman of the committee, the staff, <coughs> the budget council? Who does it have to come from? You just need someone that has the authority to represent the committee. So they could have asked Senator Bob to get in touch with you. And as long as the letter says, on behalf of the committee, I'm requesting you to show up at this hearing or to provide us this information, that's fine. Okay. You just need someone <coughs> in writing that requests you to come on behalf of that committee. Oh, Jody first and then Jeff. And of course, if it doesn't, that simply moves it over to the lobbying column, which you need to be cognizant of that it's not everything you do, but it's still doable with right. limits. If you're not a private town patient. Exactly. Right. Yes. Jeff. Dennis, could you talk more about subsequent use? Is that, is that a little tricky? The subsequent use can actually get very tricky. So, for instance, if you're a private foundation that does this you know, great report and puts out all of this information, you have to be very careful that your report then, that you don't take that report and then publish it out there right before an election and actually attach it to, you should be doing you know, voting for this. You should never be publishing things saying that anyway. So for private foundations, you want to be very careful that your reports are not taken by anyone in your organization and having that done. And I'm going to say another note on, on that real quickly. When you are serving on a board or working for an organization, your views and your political and lobbying activities are your own. When you go and do that and are not representing the organization. So I've had board members and representatives of organizations say, well, I can't go out and even have my own opinion on things. Well, that's not true. You're free to have your own opinions. But you always want to be careful that your opinions and your statements and your testimony are not being attributed to the organization. So for instance, Jack may go down and speak on something and someone will say, well, you're here on behalf of the Flynn Foundation. No, I'm here on behalf of myself. And these are not the statements of the Flynn, views of the Flynn Foundation. So you want to be sure that when you are now speaking on something and you are not acting in an official capacity, you make that very clear. So that's an important thing to do. We, I have a public charity that you know, is spending money on a, on a report or analysis and they don't want it to count as a subsequent use. They want to be sure that timing is in there and they spend the money, they have the report issued, and they really want to be marking that six month period and not allowing that report to be used in those capacities before that time is up. Because then what happens is all of that funding is counted for lobbying expenditures. And you know, as Jody pointed out, you can do lobbying, but if you're, especially if you've made the 501 election, somebody needs to be tracking those expenditures because you're gonna have to report them. So to the extent you can do all these other things and not have it count as lobbying, that's a, a great advantage to not having things count. But you may find yourself in a situation where you did this report, that was not the intent of the report, you know, to be counted as lobbying or to be a lobbying expenditure, but something comes up and it's really critical, that report can be used for this thing at this time. So you're gonna have to make that decision and make that call. So that's what happens with the subsequent use, is you, somebody needs to be marking those dates if it's anticipated that's gonna be used that way. And the six month end point is in the final expenditure for the funds. There's some different dates in there, but that's sort of the rule. But it's six months from what? The date that you spent the money on the last expenditure of funds on the reports, and then before you use it for lobbying purposes. In advance of campaign, on election day? Lobbying purposes. So remember, lobbying contact is the attempts to influence legislation. Do you have something you want to ask about? We, AFW has done lots of reports and they've used them. So right, I realize I'm um, actually used by whom? You or anybody? Used by you. Because you're the one making the lobbying, in this example, lobbying contract. And especially if you do research on broad areas, like somebody's going to use that. Right. Somebody may cite the report, know. some people may use it, especially because remember, under that exception, we put it out, we disseminated it, we published it. So we can't stop other people from citing it. But then there's that whole 
Here you go. I'm going to be a little careful about that, too. Patrick, do you have a question? How does that apply to valid propositions? The valid propositions, uh, if you remember the lobbying and the, and the grassroots, when you're looking at um, valid propositions, the legislators in that case would be the general public. That's grassroots lobbying because they're the voters. So that six month block would be prior to election day? If you're sending that information out and saying, look at this report, look at what we did, here's why you should vote this way, that's where you're going to start running into that. The subsequent use doctrine has lots of ins and outs. So that's why there's kind of that rule of thumb. So I mean, we could talk a lot about kind of the exceptions and how it gets used and those types of things. And I'd be happy to maybe kind of do a Q&A type thing and get it over to you to send out to people if you want to do that. Okay. Karen. Um, any examples in Arizona of um, grant maker coalitions taking advantage of um, some of the public charity grant makers uh, working in concert with the private foundation grant makers? I've seen that work well in other states where the community foundation or the Women's Fund or the United Way uh, because of their greater flexibility on the lobbying that they can do, play a lead role in a, in a grant maker coalition. I wonder if you've seen that in Arizona. Gosh, I know we've seen that in Arizona, and you asked me that. Other people in this room, I'm sure, can make good examples.